Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar, Teaching About Juneteenth with Children's Books. I am joined by Carol Boston Weatherford, esteemed and renowned award-winning author of Juneteenth Jamboree. Incredible professor, Dr. Amanda Vickery. You may have seen her before. She joined us for our Teaching About Slavery webinar last year. Amanda is the Assistant Professor of Social Studies at the University of North Texas. And Donovan, and Donovan James, amazing early childhood and elementary educator and creator of the Black History Club. So I am truly honored to be with them all here today. And they are going to share their expertise and, and insights about teaching about Juneteenth and Black history with us. And I am Katie Potter. I am the Senior Literacy Specialist at Lee and Low Book. So before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded. The link to view the webinar and the Juneteenth book list and resources that was created specifically for this webinar will be shared within the week. And then you can always contact me at kpotter at leeandlow.com for a certificate of completion. And I just uh, wanted to remind everyone, it typically does take about a full week. And so we, we're truly thankful for your patience um, as we're compiling the video and everything together. So uh, you'll be hearing from us soon. So quickly before we dive right in, uh, we'll go. I'm going to go over some of our agenda items. We'll all introduce ourselves, and then I'll give a brief history about Juneteenth. Amanda's going to take us through some historical context and background knowledge that's important to address when you're teaching Juneteenth. Then Carol is going to take us through her process of creating Juneteenth Jamboree, as well as sharing more information about her additional books, her family history, and then some other um, important anecdotes about why she has created her books. And then we'll transition into Donovan, taking us through really important tips and strategies for teaching about Juneteenth in elementary school and for early childhood as well. And then Amanda is going to be taking us through uh, middle and high school books. And quite frankly, these uh, Amanda will be taking teaching about strategies for adults as well, for educators to take these tips to their classrooms. Then I'll share the Juneteenth book list and resources, as well as our newly revamped teacher's guide for Juneteenth Jamboree. And then we'll conclude with a question and answer. I thank you all for writing questions when you registered, um, and then we'll be taking some questions during the live stream. So uh, many of you have probably seen me before. I have done several of our webinars at uh, Lee and Low Books, and I am the literacy specialist. I develop uh, the teacher's guides and educator resources uh, for our titles. And then I also work with university professors and nonprofit organizations on incorporating diverse books into their respective programs and curricula. And so prior to Lee and Low Books, I was a teacher. I've been a literacy specialist, an educational researcher, and I have my master's in uh, childhood general education and literacy from, from Bank Street. And now on to Carol. Hi, I'm Carol Boston Weatherford and I bring greetings from North Carolina, although I am in Baltimore now because I came up for Mother's Day and the pipeline uh, yeah. went out. So yeah, I am the author of 60 plus books, the most uh, recent of which is uh, dreams for a daughter. Uh, some of my better known titles include uh, Freedom on the Menu, uh, The Greensboro Sit-Ins, Moses, When Harriet Tubman Led Her People to Freedom, and Voice of Freedom, Fannie Lou Hamer, The Spirit of the Civil Rights Movement. That is my longest title. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to writing children's books, I also teach children's literature, adolescent literature, creative writing, and a hip hop class at Fayetteville State University. Wow, and thank you so much, Carol. We are, you know, we are truly honored to be in your presence by such an incredible and well-accomplished author. So thank you so much. Hey y'all, my name is Amanda Vickery. I am an assistant professor of social studies and anti-racist education at the University of North Texas. More importantly, I am a black biracial feminist, mother scholar, educator, yogi, Beyonce hype girl. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, so my research centers on the construct of citizenship and how black teachers uh, reconceptualize it um, using their experiential and historical knowledge. 
Um, I also research how to use intersectionality as a framework to really center Black women's histories within the U.S. civic narrative. Um, and I'm a former Texas middle school social studies teacher, um, and I am super excited to be here with y'all today. It's really an honor just to share virtual space with the fabulous women on this panel. So thanks for this opportunity. Thanks, Amanda and Donovan. Hello, everyone. My name is Donovan James. I am an early childhood and elementary educator. I currently teach kindergarten. I've been teaching it for two years. Um, prior to that, I taught in a multi-age classroom with kindergarten through fifth, all in one room. So I've had a little experience with everything. Um, I graduated from Stevens College. Um, I currently teach in the Columbia Public School District here in Missouri. And I am also the creator of the Black History Club, which is a group of kiddos from kindergarten through sixth grade. And we meet for an hour every week. And we talk about Black history, the Black history that they are not learning in schools. I'm excited to be here. Nice. Thanks, Donovan. So a little bit about Juneteenth. I'm sure you all have varying degrees of knowledge about Juneteenth, but I took, and more importantly, I took a lot of this information from the backward of, uh, afterward of Juneteenth Jamboree, uh, Carol's book. So the combination of the words June and 19th is Juneteenth, and the Emancipation Proclamation took effect on January 1st, 1863, ending slavery in states in rebellion against the United States. And so it took this news two years, six months, and 19 days after President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation to reach the slaves of Texas. So Juneteenth is said to have begun on June 19, 1865, when Union soldiers arrived in Texas and told enslaved people that they were free. So people come together around the country to celebrate, to, to, uh, to celebrate Juneteenth from the early days, parades, picnics, crafts, African dance. A lot of these traditions are touched upon in Juneteenth Jamboree, which you'll see illustrations throughout this presentation from Juneteenth Jamboree, Carol's book. And so we can't wait to hear Carol um, more about Ju the creation of Juneteenth Jamboree as well as some of your other insights. And so now Amanda is going to take us through some historical context and important background information that students need when they're, you're engaging with teaching about Juneteenth in your respective setting. Yeah, so first we think it's really important that we start with some just kind of big picture understandings and definitions. Um, so really to an order, in order to understand the significance of Juneteenth, you really have to have a fundamental understanding of the institution of slavery. Um, so slavery was, you know, is when a person owns another person as property. Slavery was and is a dehumanizing institution. And it should go without saying that enslaved people did not like being enslaved and they resisted their, um, resisted the efforts of their enslavers to reduce them as commodities. And so as Katie mentioned, we did a webinar uh, last year about teaching slavery. So I definitely recommend that you take a look at that. Um, we also think it's in, in the context of Juneteenth, we think it's important for students to know that slavery was the main cause of the Civil War. I know that there are some people or state standards or politicians um, that emphasize that slavery was maybe one of the causes of the Civil War or that it was really about states' rights. Um, but it's really important to teach students that states seceded from the Union because they believed that the federal government would end slavery, which was vital to the Southern economy and, the, and their way of life. And so Southern states seceded to maintain the institution of slavery. Um, and so there are a few important documents and events um, that should be taught when you teach about Juneteenth. Um, so the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment, and General Order Number 3, when on June 19th, 1865, Union General uh, Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas and informed enslaved African Americans that the Civil War was over and that they were free. And so this historic event you know, has been celebrated as Juneteenth for the last 150 plus years. Um, but I do think that before we can begin to approach this topic with students, we as educators really need to make sure that we have done our research. And this is oftentimes content knowledge that many teachers don't have for a lot of different reasons. And so while this webinar is going to be fabulous, it's going to provide you with a lot of great, important information about teaching Juneteenth, you're not going to learn everything that you need to know from this one webinar. So it's still going to require more in-depth research, reading, discussion, and really critical reflection. Um, and so a bit later, I'll give a little bit more con uh, content knowledge. 
but then also some recommended resources where you can get more content about this topic and others related to the long Black freedom movement. And I use the long Black freedom movement just to recognize that Black people have been fighting to free themselves since arriving on these shores in the 16th and 17th centuries in, into today. Thank you so much, Amanda. And I think that's really helpful as we're transitioning into Carol's talk about Juneteenth Jam Jamboree, as well as her other really important works about Black history. And I also wanted to mention before, Carol, you start, Juneteenth Jamboree is also available in Spanish. So you see both covers here for Juneteenth Jamboree in English and in Spanish. So I think that's a really also wonderful addition to Juneteenth, especially if you're working in a bilingual or dual language classroom or if you need it in your home as well. And so on to Carol. I write the kind of books that I wanted when I was growing up and that I wanted for my children to have. I started writing children's books uh, when my own children were uh, both in diapers. I, I transitioned from writing poetry for adults to writing uh, children's books. I write books that fill in gaps uh, in, that have been left by the, his, uh, the, history, the history books that have omitted or erased so much of black history. Many of my books focus on slavery or on the freedom, the, the long African-American freedom struggle. My mission as an author is to mine the past for family stories, fading traditions and forgotten struggles. So black history, uh, when I was going to school uh, in, in Baltimore was taught year round because I went to uh, an, an all black school. It was, a it was for the most part a segregated school. There was one, one white family at the entire, in the entire elementary school. My teachers were very resourceful and they had to be back then because there were very few books that had characters that looked like me and very few books that documented uh, African-American history. Uh, Dr. LaGarrett King from the University of uh, Missouri has detailed some ways that we can not just teach about black history, but preferably teach through black history. So I didn't develop these bullets, uh, Dr. King, Dr. LaGarrett King did. So if you teach black, teach through black history, you should include uh, both power, oppression and racism. You should show black agency, perseverance and resistance. I, um, one reason I, I write about uh, the subject matter that I do is that I'm so in awe of African-American uh, resistance, resilience and remarkability. Uh, if you're te to teach through black history, you should also teach about Africa and the African diaspora. You should include not only uh, the black struggle, but also black joy and black love. You should include black identities other than uh, cisgendered Christian and middle-class black men. So you should include the diversity of African, African America. Uh, you should include uh, Black historical contention, so the you know the difficult topics and the, the controversies, as well as the problematic aspects of Black history, and finally, you should uh, make sure that you include Black excellence. And I highly encourage all the participants uh, watching to take a picture of this and to keep it in your you know on on your desk or wherever to, con to continue to refer to it and to make sure that you have books that are reflecting all of these themes in your classroom. So thank you so much, Carol, for this. One reason that I write about the slavery era is because of course I have, my family has roots in, in slavery. The, um, my, two of my enslaved ancestors came from were, were enslaved at Y House Plantation, which was the largest slaveholding plantation in all of Maryland. It is said that the, the family, the Lloyd family who came to, uh, the, to this continent when uh, in, in, during the colonial period were, um, 
the largest were the largest slaveholders uh, in the state, and and that, that and that they had perhaps as many as a thousand uh, people enslaved on their many plantations. Y House was the 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 main plantation, and that was also the plantation where a young Frederick Douglass, when he was about between the ages of six and eight, first realized that he was enslaved. So although my, uh, these two men, uh, my, my great grandfathers, Philip Mooney and Isaac Copper, who fought in the US colored troops, were not contemporaries of Frederick Douglass. They never met him. Their, an their ancestors probably did meet him. And so now, Carol, if you want, uh, thank you so much for that, for, for sharing um, your personal history with us. And, you know, now, it, you know, I would love for you to connect it to, to Juneteenth Jamboree and share a little bit about your research process behind this book and, you know, the importance of sharing this book about Juneteenth with young readers. When I wrote uh, the, the book Juneteenth the Jamboree, uh, that was really when I was making my transition from writing for adults to writing for children. It was also a period of my life when I was discovering my own family's history on, on that plantation, on White House, and when I was discovering that uh, after emancipation, my, gra my great grandfathers had founded villages on Maryland's Eastern Shore. Uh, my family also still has, still has some of that land. We've managed to hold on to some of that land. So that family history sparked my curiosity about other aspects of African-American history. I, I stumbled upon Lee and Lowe when uh, I think that they had only had maybe one list. I think Juneteenth Jamboree was on Lee and Lowe's second list. And I was you know, trying to find a publisher and send a poetry manuscript and was told that uh, Lee and Lowe had just published a poetry book and they wouldn't be publishing any poetry any, you know, again, anytime soon. But the editor asked if I might be interested in developing uh, a concept and the concept was Juneteenth. Of course, I had heard of Kwanzaa and I had even heard of Juneteenth but I didn't know an awful lot about Juneteenth at that time. So I began to, uh, to research uh, the holiday, Juneteenth is the first African-American holiday. I began to research Juneteenth, uh, which was then celebrated mostly in Texas uh, and in parts of Louisiana, Kansas, and Oklahoma, but not, it was, the celebration was not nearly as widespread as it is today. And so I, I had, I, I primarily researched how Juneteenth was celebrated in Texas, because that was, you know, kind of where the, the celebration began. And I found out things like um, the uh, that red velvet cake was a Juneteenth tra uh, tradition, that uh, red punch was a Juneteenth tradition. And like uh, other holidays that are celebrated in Texas, barbecue was part of, was part of uh, the Juneteenth, uh, Juneteenth, contemporary Juneteenth celebrations. Uh, so I created uh, a fictional story about Juneteenth uh, in which a girl named Cassandra had moved back to Texas with her family. And she, of course, missed her old friends and, you know, hadn't quite, you know, what wasn't quite sold on this, you know, this new Texas town that she was living in. And her family uh, surprised her uh, by taking her to a Juneteenth festival. She wore um, a costume that had been inherited from her mother, uh, you know, kind of an old fashioned costume. And she um, met a friend at the festival. So in addition to the story about how Juneteenth was celebrated, there is a subplot about this girl who, you know, ha is, is new in town. So that's kind of a, univer a universal theme that you find in in many children's books and about you know wanting to have friends and making new friends. So the, the, it became a celebration uh, not only of the first African-American holiday for Cassandra, but also a celebration of reuniting with family and also about making new friends at the, at the new location. As I began to um, visit schools and share the book, 
I adopted someone. And the someone is this corn husk doll. And so this corn husk doll is now 26 years old, if you can believe it. And I still have her. She doesn't travel with me anymore because I'm afraid she might be fragile, but she's ideal for the for virtual uh, virtual events <laughs> like this. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the, the ki kids are fascinated uh, by the Cornhusk doll and, and also by, by the Juneteenth celebration. Uh, other, some of the other traditions are, of course, singing, singing songs, uh, spirituals and also, uh, that originated with enslaved people and also more, um, more recently gospel, gospel music. Mm -hmm. uh, so music is usually part of Juneteenth celebrations as well. I've actually participated in a few Juneteenth celebrations myself uh, by virtue of having authored this book. So I am yes. grateful to me and Lo for um, kicking, kicking off my literary career and for right. keeping this book your in first picture, for Your first picture book of a long prolific career. In exactly, my very book. first so book. We are so proud to have it on our list. Yeah, and of course I have written many more books and the, the, the most of my books now are nonfiction as opposed to, I guess you might call this called Juneteenth Jamboree historical fiction because it deals with it, with history, but it yeah. also, it, but right. it's set in a, you know, it has a contemporary fiction, setting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's realistic fiction, but I now write primarily uh, nonfiction. And many of my books deal with difficult topics, uh, slavery, segregation, um, racial violence, and I'm often asked whether children are too tender for tough topics. And I contend that if children could, can be oppressed in the past, and, and in fact, still be oppressed in the present, then children can learn about oppression. Juneteenth is about acknowledging the oppression of slavery, but also celebrating freedom and family today. Freedom, of course, is the highest ideal of our democracy. There's a statue atop the, the, the nation's capital uh, who, whose, na whose name is Freedom. The statue is named Freedom. And you know, she's right on top of that, of that Capitol building. So freedom you know, is, was and still, still is the highest virtue and the highest value of our democracy. I believe it's never too early to raise and to teach an anti-racist, to raise anti-racist children. So why do I write about these topics? Um, because I believe that children have a, stri a stricter sense of justice than we adults do. Uh, with children, uh, and, uh, and a, a more absolute sense of justice, with children, uh, something's either right or wrong. There are no, you know, no gray areas. Like we adults tend to dwell in, in gray areas. Children also, deserve and demand a truer and a fuller history and they deserve the truth. So I write about the topics, topics like slavery and uh, segregation and freedom to bear witness for those whose voices uh, have historically been marginalized. I write about these topics to center African-Americans and our agency, to expose the roots of racism, to correct bias and omissions, and to counter homegrown prejudices. Not, not every child is raised in an anti-racist household. So books like mine can counter some of the, the racist upbringing that some children unfortunately um, are, are subjected to. And I wanna arm children as allies and anti-racist. I, I write um, diverse books, not only because I'm an African-American, but so that children of color can see themselves and white children can see children of color. So, you know, it goes back to Rudine Sims uh, Bishop's uh, windows, mirrors, and, and doors. Most of all, I want my books to spark conversations between children and the adults in their lives and to spark questions that children inevitably will ask after reading my books, like why did slavery exist? And why didn't they tell the enslaved people that they were freed? And, you know, why did it take two and a half years? So I, I want my, my books are ideal for critical literacy.
You're muted, Katie. Sorry. It also reminds me that these books, uh, your books are so incredibly important, but it also reminds me and it ties it back to your list before, Carol, of what books that you should have, that you should be reflecting and Black joy and, and love is also so important too. And so all of these together go into such a critical library and teaching and raising an, an anti-racist child too. Next slide. I think that is um, that's it, Carol. Gone. That's so, right. So thank you so much, Carol. You shared so many wonderful points and and your history, and we are eternally grateful for for that. So thank you so much, and we can't wait to see what you come out with next. And Donovan um, now is going to, I, I think that's also a really nice segue, Carol, um, into what Donovan's going to talk about, what Carol had just mentioned about critical mm -hmm. literacy and raising an anti-racist. That starts from birth. That starts in early childhood, in preschool and in kindergarten. And so Donovan is going to take us through the amazing work that she has done in the past and that she's currently doing with young children. So thank you, Donovan. Yeah. So in my classroom, uh, Black history is all year long. Um, I'm not a teacher that waits until February to introduce my students to Blackness. Um, so it's just important that when you are introducing topics with Black history, whether it be joy, love, um, or resistance, that your kids are introduced to it year long. And it's not just some sudden announcement of the enslavement of Black people, um, or just talking about Martin Luther King in January, and then we never hear of Martin Luther King again. Um, so um, when you start bringing those Black histories in there, be sure to be thinking of that. And that leads me into my next point about looking in the curriculum. Um, I look at the curriculum for the year or the month or whatever we're working on, and I look for the spaces where Black people or Black histories are missing. And there are a lot of empty spaces if you're looking at your curriculum, whether it be science, social studies, reading or writing. Um, and taking different texts like Juneteenth Jamboree um, and bringing that into the classroom and into different curriculum. So when I read Juneteenth Jamboree in my classroom, we were talking about holidays and celebrations. And usually when you talk about holidays and celebrations, you talk about Christmas or uh, 4th of July or Valentine's Day. Um, but what about bringing in those holidays that people don't normally talk about like Juneteenth? Um, so I brought that book in and paired it with some other texts and my students were able to, which as I said, my students are five and six, they're in kindergarten. So we're able to read the book and kind of process and like Carol was saying, this critical literacy, they were asking questions and they were talking and I was talking, and, and, but they're able to sit amongst each other and question and answer each other's questions and refer back to the text to answer questions. So it's a really cool exchange of conversation with um, students and children that we believe are maybe too young to understand um, certain topics. Um, and so it's really important in my classroom as well to provide these books. Um, I use a lot of Carol's books in my classroom. I was telling my students today why I wasn't going to be at school today and they were so excited because we use a lot of her books to talk about these topics um, and do different activities with them but have a lot of conversation which is important in an important way to get your students engaged in these conversations and in this text. You have to get them talking. Um, these are not books that you, you just kind of read and kind of let go, like allowing them time to engage in the text. Uh, some books I'm not always able to read in one setting. Sometimes it takes us days to kind of get through a text, especially with young readers. Um, and it just takes a little time to process, but allowing them the time to process it and have the conversations will definitely um, get them engaged. And just be careful to not underestimate your kids with this content. Um, when we talked about Juneteenth, we mapped out the who, what, when, where, why, and how. So we read the book, and then we actually read this book twice. So we read it the first time, just talking about it, and then we read it again to answer our questions. Like, what is it? Who is involved? Why is this happening? And we were able to create a chart that is still hanging up in our classroom. And they put like party hats around it because it's such a cool celebration to them. Um, and they are able to celebrate that and refer back to that. So anytime we talk about holidays now, 
they're always like, remember that book? They may not know the title, but you know, remember that book, remember that celebration, it's back there. And so just making the time to have these conversations and read these books are really important, especially for um, young children. Nice, Donovan. Those are all great tips. And so if you wanted to take us through Donovan, I know you said that you look for space in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really helpful to, to people listening right now. Could you take us through some of these other books? And also, you know, how are you strategic when you're looking for that space? You know, what, what are the ways in which you fit in the books? Um, you know, how do you connect the books to the, to the curriculum that you have to work with? If you could give us a little bit of, um, of details about that, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So um, just for example, with science, um, we do a topic on living and non-living things. And we talk about, you know, animals are living, plants are living, some things are not living. You can only go so far, but the curriculum requires I talk about this you know, for four to five weeks. Um, and so we talked about um, biologists. What is a biologist? A person that studies living things. And so we talked about Ernest Everett Just. If you don't know about Ernest, y'all need to look him up. And there's a book written about him. So we talked about him and how he is a biologist and how he lived during segregation. And we talked about, you know, what is segregation? And just um, to give you a, a timeline, we talked about this back in October. So this is not Black History Month. This is not Martin Luther King Day. This is just our regular school day. And we're talking about science. So I look at the topics. So I'm looking at science, biology. Okay, let me research some black biologists. If we're studying poetry, which we recently did, where are the black poets in my curriculum? Um, whether we're studying, uh, even with writing, like let's get some mentor texts by, you know, black writers. So really, um, just really being purposeful about why look, bringing in people of color, um, especially with, you know, black histories. We talked about civil rights. Um, not too long ago, we talked about voting. Can you bring in voting um, and how Black people fought to vote? So just really being purposeful and looking at the text and, you know, as an educator, parent, doing the research and then finding the books because books are such a great way to communicate um, information, especially to kids. They look at the pictures and sometimes we don't even read the words. Sometimes I just let my kids look at the pictures in the books and they can talk about them and have these conversations. Um, so just looking at what you're teaching and finding ways to integrate um, different histories. I love that tip about looking at the pictures because a lot of picture book biographies can be quite dense, especially yeah. for kindergarten. And so that is just an immediate strategy that teachers can take back with them right now and, mm -hmm. and implement it into their work. And I also love the map, your, what Donovan, what you said about mapping, look at your entire curriculum and then do the research, write down the books that you're going to complement and supplement. So that it's not a last minute thing that you're looking at it the whole year. And this is what I'm, you know, of course you can make changes throughout the way, but I just, I love that. So thank you so much, Donovan. I think mm -hmm. these are really tangible, concrete tips that can, that teachers and librarians, whoever is listening can immediately, parents can immediately take with them into their work. So thank you so much. And so Amanda is going to take us through uh, middle and high school. Thanks so much, Amanda. Yeah, so, yeah, so with uh, secondary students, I think it's important to really use primary sources. Although when I was a middle school teacher, I used a lot of picture books with my middle schoolers. Um, there's a lot of great picture books that are available um, that are a little bit uh, more difficult content that are a little bit longer that are absolutely appropriate to use with uh, middle school students. Like for example, I was saying uh, to Carol, I used her Fannie Lou Hamer book with my middle schoolers and they absolutely loved it. Um, so with secondary, but also with elementary uh, young children as well, using primary sources to have students to help them understand the significance of Juneteenth and why it's such an important holiday. Um, but also that to show them that the struggle continues. And as Carol mentioned, that's kind of what Juneteenth is also about. Um, so in my personal opinion, you can't teach a single lesson on Juneteenth. I think there's so much content and there's so much history that students need to have in order to really uh, understand, again, the significance of this important holiday. Um, so one thing that I would recommend is to do uh, craft like a critical inquiry. And so Ryan Crowley and LeGarrette King wrote a, an article, a short article in the Social Studies Journal about crafting critical inquiries. Um, 
And so they say that critical inquiries, they ask compelling and supporting question that ex questions that explicitly critique systems of power and oppression. It also allows, exposes students to primary sources that are written by those who had been historically marginalized. And then students take informed action to really push them to take tangible steps towards alleviating injustices that were explored in the inquiry. Um, and so when thinking about Juneteenth, one thing I would, you know, ask students, you know, what does it mean to be free? Um, what do they know about the lives of enslaved persons in the United States? So it's really important for students to have this fundamental understanding of the institution of slavery and the lives of enslaved persons to, again, to understand why Juneteenth is significant. Um, and so for primary sources, the 1619 Project by the New York Times and partnership with the Smithsonian Museum of African American History, they have some really fabulous primary sources that I've used with my pre-service teachers to help them understand different aspects of the institution of slavery. And so going back to inquiry, um, you could ask students, you know, what does it mean to be free? What is the nation's birthday? You know, what is considered the nation's birthday? And so most students will say July 4th. And you can ask students, why is July 4th the nation's birthday? And then you could follow up with what is Ju uh, July 4th? What does it represent? Why is this holiday significant? To whom is it significant? And then you can ask students on July 4th, 1776, was every person who was living in what would later become the United States, were they free? Why or why not? Um, and we want teachers to really get students to question whether or not July 4th should be referred to as Independence Day when not everyone living in the country at the time was free. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones wrote um, the first chapter in the book, um, 400 Souls, uh, edited by Ibram X. Kendi and uh, uh, Keisha Blaine. Um, she said that while the American Revolution it liberated white people while ensuring uh, another century of subjugation for black people. So I think it's important for students, for teachers to kind of frame the July 4th holiday as that, and to get them to recognize that. Um, and then once students have- souls right here. Oh yeah, 400 souls, yes. Fabulous book. I'm about halfway through it, but I'm, it's, it's really powerful work. Um, but once students have an understanding of, of slavery, you can then present students with excerpts from What to a Slave is the 4th of July by Frederick Douglass. And so on July 5th, 18, I think 52 or 53, Frederick Douglass was invited to give an address at an Independence Day uh, celebration in New York. And so Douglass gave this really powerful speech that highlighted the hypocrisy of the celebration of the 4th of July and the ideals that these founding fathers represented, who many of them um, enslaved people. So Frederick Douglass argues that these founding fathers were men with really great ideals, but their ideals of freedom and equality were in conflict because of the existence of slavery on American soil. And so he really interrogates the meaning of the Declaration of Independence to enslaved African Americans um, experiencing this grave inequality and injustice. And so one of my all time favorite parts of the speech was when he said, you know, this 4th of July is yours, not mine you may rejoice, I must mourn. Um, and so because the text is difficult for, might be difficult for students, um, I'd recommend you know, analyzing the speech as a whole class in sections. Another option is to put excerpts on it on chart paper and have students work in small groups to illustrate the different sections and then present it to the class. Um, another important document when teaching about Juneteenth is the Emancipation Proclamation, which Katie mentioned earlier, which was issued by President Lincoln um, in 1862 that ended slavery as a military necessity um, in the states that are in rebellion against the United States. And so it's important for students to take away from the Emancipation Proclamation. Because it de demonstrates that the federal government declared that Black freedom was a priority of the US government, and that was their re reason for fighting and, and ending the Civil War. And it also led to Black men being able to join the Union Army to fight for their freedom. And so students need to understand that, you know, why the Emancipation Proclamation didn't successfully or immediately end slavery across the United States. It took the, th legally it took the 13th Amendment to do that, which was passed in 1865. Um, but thinking about the Emancipation Proclamation, you can have students kind of brainstorm, you know, why didn't it free enslaved persons? You know, a few reasons were Texas was the most Southern and Western Confederate state and took a long time for news to reach Texas. The Confederacy also didn't recognize Lincoln as their president, so would they chose to ignore the order. Also enslavers didn't inform enslaved persons of their freedom and they continued to exploit them and instead waited on government you know, agents to come and share the news. And so in Texas, it wasn't until you know, June 19th, 1865 when 
U.S. General um, Gordon Granger, you know, two and a half, half years after the Emancipation Proclamation and almost two months after the surrender of Lee at Appomattox Courthouse, where he issued this general order number three that informed the people of Texas that all enslaved persons are now free. And this is a really significant moment in our history because this day, this holiday, it actually represents, it is freedom realized. Um, and so it's, I think it's a really important, the, the, the order, the order that General Granger issued is really important primary source. So I encourage teachers to use that with their students. And while the document is really historic because it did bring freedom to enslaved persons in Texas, but it's also hypocritical and problematic. The order is not only contains racist language, um, but also General Granger informs black Americans that they could not depend on the protections from Union troops and many ended up continuing to work in very oppressive circumstances. So it almost kind of previews what we see after reconstruction. Um, but again, you know, it's, piggybacking off of what Donovan and Carol mentioned, one thing I will stress what's important to teach about with Juneteenth is teaching about black joy and celebration and family. Um, Juneteenth is a very important holiday in the black community, especially in my home state of Texas, you know, for the last century. Um, the Austin History Center, as well as the Library of Congress has some really great primary sources showing Juneteenth celebrations since 1900. They have a lot of primary sources, especially from uh, Emancipation Park in Houston, um, which I believe is like, you know, one of the oldest parks in Houston. It's, it's really, really significant because it was one of the few parks available to Black Americans during Jim Crow. And that's where a lot of the uh, Juneteenth celebrations uh, took place in Houston. So there's great primary sources around that. You can create photo timelines to show the different ways that Black Americans have celebrated Juneteenth from the 20, turn of the 20th century to today. And again, Juneteenth is an opportunity to, you know, to really reflect on whether the US is living up to its founding ideals. And so it's important to connect the past to the present and to you know, have students think about, okay, so what, what there's work that still needs to be done. You know, Juneteenth isn't a federal holiday. Not all states and communities celebrate it. Um, Opal Lee is a woman in Fort Worth, Texas who has been trying every year to raise awareness about Juneteenth and to get it a federal holiday. Um, so it's important to share that with students and give them the opportunity to, to make change. Oh, is this me? Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, are... oh, sorry. Go ahead, Amanda. Oh, no, I was just going to say these are some really great resources um, um, that I would definitely recommend and I would definitely use um, uh, to teach Juneteenth um, for a lot of different grade levels. Yeah. So, so, Amanda, many of the ones that you meant, all of the ones, the resources that Amanda, Donovan, and Carol have mentioned are here. We will send some more out with, within the email um, that well, some other ones that were mentioned I here. I'm, I'm not sure if they're here, but this contains almost all of them. So keep a lookout for the email where we'll list all of the sources. So we have a PDF of um, Lee and Lowe books um, that apply to Juneteenth that you could that you could also use to connect uh, to Juneteenth Jamboree. So we have those books and then the additional books that Amanda and Donovan talked about and then Carol's books that also apply to June, talking about Juneteenth and Black history as well as the, the resources that we shared. And so these are some books. I'm sorry that the covers are so small because they're all so beautiful, but they are, these are some relevant books by Carol that apply to our talk today um, about Black history and about the themes that Carol shared with us. And so these, this is all going to be in the book list and resource section. And so Juneteenth Jamboree also has a teacher's guide that's free online to download. So I highly recommend that you check it out. If you want to teach Juneteenth Jamboree in your classroom, it has a lot of the resources that we shared in this webinar, as well as some other teaching um, ideas, activities, it's background information, et cetera. And so this is for, available for free online. And you can also check out the books as well as the collect, um, as well as the PDF online at our Juneteenth collection as well. So we have a lot of questions that that I want to make sure to get to. Amanda, this is this is piggybacking off of what um, what someone just said, but 
are there important distinctions between Juneteenth celebrations in different regions or states? I know that you mentioned it's, of course, a, you know, of course, it's an incredibly important holiday in uh, Texas. Do you, could you touch upon, you know, the Texas, um, you know, Texas versus other states? Any, Carol and Donovan, feel free to jump in as well. Yeah, so I only really have experience with Juneteenth celebrations in Texas because that's where I am. That's my knowledge. Um, and it's, you know, as Carol mentioned in Juneteenth Jamboree, there's kind of things that are associated with historic Juneteenth celebrations in Texas. So um, parades, music, um, arts and craft, dancing, uh, food, uh, family. Um, you know, those are all kind of staples of, of, of it being celebrated in Texas. And then we saw, you know, kind of with the, the various great migrations, people, you know, migrating out of the South and going North, Midwest, to the West Coast, East Coast, uh, all over the United States, they take that with them. Um, and we even see Juneteenth celebrations. I was reading, listening to an NPR uh, story not too long ago about Juneteenth celebrations in Africa as well. Um, and so I feel like they're all kind of different. I don't have a lot of knowledge about that, about the other celebrations um, in other parts of the country. Um, but I think that's important to, you know, to, to explore with your students. Mm. The one thing I'd like to say is that um, Juneteenth celebrations often, almost always now, I think bring in community organizations, uh, organizations that, you know, work year round uh, with uh, the African-American community. So there might be health screenings, um, you know, just organizations that address the, that take a holistic approach to um, well being. And so, you know, there's civil rights organizations might be involved. Uh, just it depends, it varies from community to community, but there are always uh, nonprofit groups involved and churches. La mm -hmm. Last year, we saw a lot with the 2020 election, a lot of voter registration drives okay. at some associated with Juneteenth celebrations as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Donovan, did you have, did you want to add anything? Uh, not really. I mean, I know in Kansas, I'm not there anymore. Well, my family lives there, but in Kansas City, it's like a weekend long thing. And there's, mm -hmm. like they were saying, there's community organizations, there may be health screens, but like, it's just really big on community and music and food and just really nice. celebrating. Yeah. Yeah. And nice. a lot of libraries have begun to sponsor uh, Juneteenth celebrations. Great. Yeah, so it sounds like wherever wherever you all are, do your research and look up what's happening in your community and um, go from there. But and then this also ties into our next, you know, what I wanted to talk about next. This is essentially a combination of, of different questions, you know, how a lot of panelists know, how can I incorporate celebrating the Juneteenth holiday in my school without cultural appropriation and as a white educator or librarian? What does that look like? You know, what do you three, you know, have to say about that particular question? I think it might look like bringing someone in from the, from the community. It could be a parent, you know, who's, uh, involved in the school or it could be some other community member who mm -hmm. is involved uh, in the in the local Juneteenth uh, celebration or who might be able to lend some perspective uh, about uh, some historic perspective uh, from at least from the from their lifetime uh, of what a Juneteenth celebration might involve. Nice. Mm -hmm. And I know in my classroom it can look like just take giving that information and having your kids take on that learning. I know uh, we went through Pebble Go, vocabulary, like there's so many resources on Juneteenth. So I just allow my students to do their own research on it um, and bring in the information that they know, kind of like an inquiry, they have questions, they go and answer them and then like creating something that um, honors what it is that they have researched. So you can even just take things like this and allow introduce research to your students and allowing them to put it on uh, for themselves. And it doesn't feel like you have to do all the work, but just, you know, handing the baton over to them, allow them to do the research and the learning and then have them create something um, that celebrates Juneteenth. And I think it's important when we're, when we're um, studying 
uh, and teaching through Black history to let students take the lead, uh, you know, in terms of uh, asking the questions. And yes, even in terms of uh, determining what type of experiential learning is going to be connected to, to the unit. So I think that's important to, you know, it's important to give the students some agency. Um, Amanda, this question um, I'd like to pose to you as well as to, to Carol and Donovan, if you have anything to add. What do white allies need to know about teaching Juneteenth to make the experience non-toxic for their students? I know that this is quite um, quite a, a detailed, the, this question requires a quite a detailed answer. So if, you know, if you can share any any insight that you'd like to provide, that would be great. Yeah, so I'll just, um, I'll kind of say, so um, I prefer to use the term co-conspirator instead of ally. So Bettina Love is a professor at University of Georgia and she writes in her book, We Want to Do More Than Survive Abolitionist Teaching about the, the concept of co-conspirators. Um, so allies, they've read the books, they know the terms but they don't take action. Mm -hmm. um, but co-conspirators, they know the terms, they know what white privilege is, they know what white supremacy means, and they're willing to take risks and put something on the line for someone else. So use their whiteness and their privilege to dismantle racism. Um, so to go back to your question, I think it's really important that, you know, we need more white teachers to be unapologetic co-conspirators, anti-racist educators who are committed to listening, learning, and willing to give up some of their power and use their privilege to invite and invite others to lead. So follow the lead of black educators, activists, community members, um, but also at the same time, be prepared to take uh, political risks. Um, so, and I think, you know, thinking about, you know, white educators teaching Juneteenth, I think it's important that, you know, this is a holiday that is literally about freedom. So it is an important holiday. It needs to be celebrated across this country in every classroom and community. Um, but again, as kind of, you know, Carol mentioned, I think that it, it should be done in full equitable partnership with black leaders and black communities. Um, and I also think it's important that when we're teaching Juneteenth um, to teach, you know, as, as Carol mentioned, she was, you know, quoting my dear friend, LeGarrette King, teaching through, uh, not teaching about Black history, teaching through Black history. Um, so when you're teaching Juneteenth, don't just teach it as, oh, it's a holiday where, you know, slaves were no longer free. And then you kind of move on and students are left with like, why was there slavery? Like you have to do the hard work and have those difficult conversations so students understand the significance of Juneteenth, but then also that the work, the struggle continues. Um, the work still needs to be done. Um, so again, just, um, like I said, you know, thinking about, you know, being a co-conspirator, what that means, decentering whiteness in your history curriculum, um, I think is really important. Wow, Amanda, thank you. And that co-conspirator, someone in the chat was really was excited about that term. And I think that's really helpful in moving forward. Um, and I certainly will be using that term from now on. Um, so I think we have time for maybe a few, one more question question. Carol, you have so many books, wonderful, amazing books. You know, if you were to pick several titles to pair alongside Juneteenth Jamboree, what would you pick? You know, well, several of them were, several of them were on the slide that you um, created, Katie. Uh, so yeah. I would, I would probably choose the books that are, um, first, the books that are set during the slavery era. So mm -hmm. Moses, which is behind, you can sit behind me. Uh, it's about Harriet, is uh, a, um, I call it an unbiography of Harriet Tubman, uh, about her, sp her spiritual quest, her spiritual reckoning uh, prior to becoming uh, a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Uh, Box, uh, Hen how Henry Brown mails himself to freedom about one of slavery's most daring escapes. And both of, you know, both of these books frame, uh, you know, how important freedom was and uh, how motivated uh, enslaved people were to become free. Uh, another book is uh, By and By, Charles Albert Tinley, the father of gospel music, who was not himself enslaved, but was, uh, but his, I believe his father was, his, definitely his father was enslaved and he worked alongside 
enslaved people prior to becoming a gospel composer. So those are just those, and, and uh, of course, Freedom in Congo Square, mm -hmm. which um, shows how uh, Congo Square uh, and the gatherings that enslaved people and free blacks uh, held there actually helped preserve African traditions that led to New Orleans uh, giving birth to jazz. Thanks, so those Sarah. are just a few. That's really helpful. Actually, this is the this is our last question, but I want to I want to emphasize and to clarify to to our participants, and I think that our panelists have done a wonderful job in explaining this. But there there have been several questions about you know how would you integrate Juneteenth into your curriculum if your school year ends before June nineteenth? I'm you know I'll say something and then I'll have our panelists elaborate, but it's not like what Amanda, Donovan, and Carol have said, it doesn't happen. It's not going to happen in one lesson. It's not even going to happen in two lessons. This is, has to be part, an integral part of your curriculum. And so if any of you want to elaborate on that a little bit. Donovan, do you well, mind? Well, I just, I just like to say, I, I'd like to share um, a, a best practice that I've seen uh, a school use to uh, with, with another one of my books that I think could be used uh, to make that home school connection uh, with the June, for the Juneteenth holiday, particularly since uh, many schools are closed by the time uh, the observance take, takes place. And that is to send a bookmark home. Uh, if, you know, if, you, if, if the book can go home too, that's even better, but send a bookmark home that has just uh, some key terms, you know, like slavery, freedom. You can't, you can't learn it all from, you know, from a little, you know, from bullet points, but also might have the date of a local Juneteenth celebration and, and maybe um, a recipe for a Juneteenth celebration, not, not meaning a recipe to cook something, but like what are some of the components, traditional components of a Juneteenth celebration? Nice. Love that idea, Carol, that's great. Yeah, and Donovan, you can think about- sorry. Go ahead, Amanda. Oh, no, I'm just gonna really quickly say, um, you know, think about in a social studies unit. So a lot of early uh, elementary grades talk about holidays. So Juneteenth is a holiday that you can, you can absolutely talk about. Yeah. Uh, again, these are conversations that should happen throughout the year, but then also thinking about, I know schools are typically closed in the summertime, but how powerful would it be for you know, schools to be the sites of Juneteenth celebrations. Um, you know, I think that is something to consider or to advertise on social media, like, hey, there's a Juneteenth celebration in our community, advertise it to families. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of different ways. I, I'm totally taking the one that, uh, that Carol mentioned about the bookmark. I think that's another lovely way to, to spread words about it as well. Actually, before, thank you both so much, Donovan. I wanted you to talk about that question, but I changed my mind. I want you to talk about another question. Someone asked, because I'm, I'm really curious too. Someone asked about the Black History Club and if it's possible to implement into their own school district. Could you talk a little bit about Black, your Black History Club and what that would entail for someone wanting to start their own? Yeah, um, so the my Black History Club is not um, actually a part of my school district. It's something that I do separate, but I definitely think it's something you can um, integrate into your school district. Uh, basically, I just outlined the year. It starts in September and it ends this month, unfortunately. Um, but then there's another round of it. But I just basically take those months and I do a theme each month. So the first month we talk about defining um, Black history, like what is Black history? And just talking about, you know, how not all uh, Black people are African American. Um, and just talking about the African diaspora. And so we just really dive deep, go deep into that. And then we talked about, um, we did a study on the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, we talked about black artists and musicians. So there was a theme each month and we just met for an hour. They did activities. We've done directed drawings. They've uh, made a newspaper uh, to tell people about um, the Greenwood District and what happened there. Um, so it's just really, and we re read a lot of, a lot of books um, and I just give them a lot of agency. So they bring black history to me. 
I bring, bring Black history to them, but it's just really talking about the things that they aren't learning about in school and the things that I think are important for students to know about um, Black history, like the joy um, and the resistance and the love and the different types of love. So I would love to, if you want to email me, uh, love to chat yeah. with you. Or, or check goes. out your, your handle. Um, yeah. To, to yeah, and the Black Friday. History Club also has a um, Instagram page where we sh share that. But yeah, I think that would be great um, for okay. you to integrate into your school district. Carol, who joined you? This, this is my mom. I, I typed it in the text. My mom, uh, Carol in Boston, who uh, retired as an administrator in Baltimore City Public Schools, but began her career in segregated schools in Appalachia. Uh, where she told me she used to begin the school year by having her students erase marks from uh, cast off textbooks that they got, you know, got from inherited from white schools. Wow. So she was a very in foreign language, uh, particularly in French. Yeah, because the, 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 the students had translated already translated some of the, the passages in the textbook. So she's wow. she's a fighter and uh, she's got a she's got a fist on her wall. When I saw everybody else had a fist, I thought about get, going to get her a picture of the, the clenched <laughs> fist, but I, I didn't want to run away. So <laughs> yeah. Wow, thank you for joining us at the end. Thank you for permitting it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having Carol. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. We are honored to have Carol. Um, well, everyone, that uh, that was fabulous. We have so many amazing comments that people have learned so much from this and are taking these ideas back into their communities, into their schools. So thank you so much. Thank you all. And you will have <laughs> someone said, so cool to meet your mom, Carol. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Again, uh, we will be sending out the link within the week with all of these resources, books, et cetera. And feel free to email me for a certificate of completion. Again, I want to, to extend my gratitude to Carol, Amanda, and Donovan for sharing their time, expertise, energy, everything with us. So thanks all and have a good evening. <laughs>